Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Growing more with less is the mantra of Nebraska's corn farmers, and they're using incredible technology to do it. Soil moisture monitors let them know when their crop needs water and how much. GPS systems eliminate overlaps in the field, saving fuel and money. New hybrids reduce the use of pesticides and increase yields. When you're talking new technology and innovation, Nebraska corn farmers are all ears. Nebraska's family corn farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs gives us his thoughts on cattle markets. Allison Van Enenim discusses genetically engineered animals. Bruce Anderson updates us on range and pasture conditions. And Bob Wright talks about battling rootworm resistance in corn. Mike Briggs is our cattle market analyst this week. In 2014, Nebraska achieved something it never had before. The state exported more than $1 billion worth of beef. The Nebraska Department of Ag says the total volume of beef exports has doubled since 2009, while the value of muscle cuts shipped during that time increased by 250 percent. Meanwhile, meat prices across the country continue to rise. The price for all fresh retail beef jumped nine cents in December, averaging exactly six dollars per pound. That new high was 96 cents more expensive than December 2013. Of the 12 months last year, only two recorded a price drop from the previous month for that category of meat. The cost of ground beef increased every month in 2014, except for December. We talked with Mike Wednesday morning about beef demand and margins in the feedlot, but after a recent slide in cattle markets, we began by mentioning how tough the last couple weeks have been. Woo! Yes, it has. The funds decided it was time to get out, and when they do that, they do it all at once. You think the funds, because this is what you referenced the last time we were here, you think they have that much impression? My concern with the funds is, and here's my soapbox talk for the day, cowboys are always worried about how many cattle the packers are feeding. And that, that's a concern and that's fine, but you better start worrying about how large the fund positions are in our relatively thinly traded and small cattle market. Because they get those things so big, whenever they decide to move, that's the way the market's gonna go. And the, the exchanges are not gonna self-regulate because they're making a lot of money off all, those, all that fund trading, so they don't wanna do it. I don't have a problem with funds in general, I just have a concern about how big we let their positions get so that they start swaying this market around. They can't do that like in the stock market as easily because it's so big, but our cattle market's not that big. But how much of this is fundamental in the cattle markets? In my mind, zero. Nothing's changed. We didn't make any more cattle over the holiday weekend, you know, over the holiday season. The cattle, in fact, slaughter numbers are not as high as a lot of people anticipated them. The last time you guys were here, we talked about how we might have a little dip. This wasn't what I was talking about. It wasn't what I referred to, but I, I was going on the fact that we thought there would be a, a little bit of a rise in the slaughters, and there has not been. So this is all technical, and the funds trade technicals, and once it starts going, it's going. Now today we've stabilized a little bit. Um, Cash is less than last week, but we're getting more for cat a dollar higher today for cash than we got yesterday. And it really kind of looked like they had us on the ropes yesterday. So I learned a long time ago from a gentleman that basis is the best indicator of demand. And we are trading cattle at $10 over the board. So if we're trading that kind of a basis, that says the demand is pretty darn good here up front. Now, once that starts to whittle away, which I anticipate it probably will, it'll equalize, that's what it's supposed to do. It'll do that eventually, and that'll kind of signal that maybe it's time for the board to go back the other way, but we'll see. Where's that demand coming from? 
I just don't think there's enough cattle for these packers to keep going and the packers are in the black and so that's helpful because then they're going to want to process cattle so that's a great for us because we don't ever want to start backing up cattle even if there's not very many so as long as these packers are buying cattle you know and that was the interesting thing the first week after the holidays we had a huge show list and everybody's like oh god here it comes and they sucked those up like there was never going to be another one well, they obviously didn't anticipate these lower slaughter numbers either, but they're making money, so I think they're, we're good there. There's concerns as we go out front, though, with the dollar and exports and the drop credit and things like that that bother me. Because? Well, the American dollar is so strong because ours is the only co economy that's really doing really well, excluding China. And so therefore our dollar is really high and everybody else's currency is low, so it makes it very difficult for them to import not only our beef, but our, our hides and our off on all that stuff. And once that drop, that drop credit has been really high and the packer makes a lot of money off that. You start whittling that drop credit away, you start whittling into his profits and eventually that slides down to us. That chunk that got taken out of this market, does that indicate that now the top has been set? I don't want to say that, but of course I'm not very smart. I guess I'm more hopeful than anything. I'm hoping because once again, we didn't make any more cattle. I'm hoping with cheap gas, putting more money back in consumers' pockets, and when we get to grilling season, we almost always have an up, and I'd like to think we're gonna catch another one, but will we make new highs? I don't know. I think we went too high last year. I think, and that's one of the deals where the funds were pushing it the way we wanted them to push it, and they went a little too far. So, I don't know. I, but I would like to think we'd make one more run, but I could be wrong. Give me a peek at where margins are. Margins are really are still good up front. Now we've taken, you know, we've taken twenty dollars out of the board. We've taken ten dollars out of the cash in the last ten days. So you know they're not as good as they were, but they're still okay. I, I I think they're fine. Where the difficulty comes in, we've got the board and the cash at such an inverse to the deferreds. You're trying to buy cattle against a 142, 143 August with the cash market up here at 162 makes it really difficult. You got a lot of guys, math whizzes out there buying cattle that they're just going to say, well, it's going to be 100, it's 162 now, it's got to be 162 then, and they're buying against that, which go ahead, I hope you're right. Next week, John Moret from J.E. Moret Grain Company will join us to analyze corn and soybean markets. On December 10th in Washington, D.C., a House subcommittee on health held a hearing to examine the FDA's role in regulating genetically modified food ingredients. One of the witnesses testifying that day was Allison Van Enenim from UC Davis. Allison is a cooperative extension specialist in animal genomics and biotechnology at that university. She spoke on UNL's Innovation Campus last week as part of the Huerman Lecture Series discussing the use of genetic modification in agriculture, specifically genetically engineered animals. We talked with Allison before her presentation and began by asking, what is a genetically engineered animal? Genetically engineered animals are kind of a sub group of genetically modified animals. So if you have a pet dog and it's a Chihuahua or a Great Dane, I think you could probably agree we've been genetically modifying animals for a long time. But genetically engineered are specifically those that are produced using recombinant DNA technology. And they are modified for things like maybe disease resistance or producing proteins in their milk for pharmaceutical applications or a whole range of purposes like that. But it's really the use of recombinant DNA technology is what is the Character, character that's a, a genetically engineered animal. What such animals like that exist? Um, none in the food supply mm -hmm. at the current time. Um, there have been some approved for pharmaceutical uses, so goats that make pharmaceuticals in their milk, um, also rabbits. And then there's the glowfish. I don't know if you've been to the aquarium store where there's fluorescent uh, genetically engineered fish that Grow, glow red and green for aquarium purposes. And then there's work uh, ongoing with genetically modified mosquitoes uh, to try to control the reproduction and prevent them from transmitting diseases, uh, both to humans and livestock. Why have none come to market? Um, so when you're talking about genetically engineered foods for uh, human purposes, it, there's a, a regulatory process that they have to go through. There's a mandatory FDA review process and there's only one uh, genetically engineered animal 
product that's tried to go through that, and that's the Aqua Advantage salmon, a fast-growing Atlantic salmon. Um, and it's been in regulatory for rather a long time. The first fish was produced uh, 25 years ago in 1989. Um, it's completed all of its regulatory review, and it's basically just stuck in regulatory gridlock. Mm. Um, it's completed all of its safety studies and has been waiting since 2010 for a decision, one way or the other, from the Food and Drug Administration. Are there fears from consumers over GE animals, and what are those fears? Yeah, th it's GE animals sounds very frightening. Genetically modified anything sounds very frightening, and I think that there are concerns that uh, you know that scientists are working in their labs <laughs> making Franken foods and Franken fish, mm -hmm. and um, so there's there's natural um, safety concerns, and then there's also a kind of an ethical issue I think with genetically engineered animals that maybe wasn't part of the plant debate, and that is you're tinkering with animals, and that somehow there's there's a moral or you know that shouldn't be doing that but I think what hasn't been well described to the public is what the technology could be used for and it could be used to introduce really uh, traits that I think you couldn't bring in any other way disease resistant traits for example that would actually be beneficial to the animals in terms of them not getting sick and then also consequently not getting treated with antibiotics mm -hmm. um, which is of course um, both an animal welfare concern and then also a food safety concern and generally being more productive as a result of not getting ill which would also fit in with sustainability goals and so I think people that don't know anything about the technology are, know that it sounds a bit scary but and don't know that there might be benefits associated with it and that's I think where the real education piece has to come because really you can achieve some from some breeding goals using this technology that you can't do in any other way. What do you think the chances are that a GE animal never comes to market? <laughs> in the U.S.? That's a pessimistic question. So um, there's no, undoubtedly, uh, you know, that the regulatory situation at the moment has shown that, that it's not possible for, for this particular mm -hmm. fish to come to market at the current time. Um, there's a lot of applications in the pipeline um, that maybe have uh, more, um, you know, disease-resistant animals, that type of thing that maybe might have more public support. But mm -hmm. I think what I'm seeing is that uh, there's been uh, a movement of the technology to other countries uh, where maybe the need is greater and also uh, with a, a different uh, approach to the regulatory system, so particularly um, countries like Brazil and Argentina and China uh, that are working diligently in this area and that's of course in the developing world is yeah. where the huge demand for animal proteins is coming from in the next 20 or 30 years and so um, I, I think that those countries will be able to adopt this technology and, and use it in their agricultural production systems. But the US? Um, <laughs> it's, that's asking a crystal ball. Um, you know, given how long it's taken for this first product to come through, maybe as other countries get to use this technology and, and this country can't, you know, that puts um, American agriculture mm -hmm. at a disadvantage and perhaps as people become more comfortable with the fact that this technology, for example, is, you know, being used to make disease resistant animals that doesn't mm -hmm. have any food safety concerns, um, then maybe there'll be a turnaround and it can be seen as part of a, you know, producing uh, animal proteins more sustainably and that it may get uh, more likely to come to market. But I'm not going to go out on a limb and say <laughs> never or in 10 years time because I wouldn't have thought I'd be sitting here in 2015 with a fish that was created 25 years ago, which is basically just a fast growing salmon, still not being able to come to the food market. Allison's full interview can be found on the Market Journal website. It includes an additional question regarding GMO food labeling. You can also find our interview on our site with Ruth McDonald from last week's episode of Market Journal discussing the safety of GMOs in food production. We've told you before that Nebraska farmers in 2014 planted 96 percent of their corn to a genetically engineered variety. But only a small chunk of that, 4 percent, was to solely insect resistant BT varieties. Earlier this week, we talked with Nebraska Extension entomologist Bob Wright about the challenges in controlling rootworms, which are now showing resistance. We started by asking Bob to recap how rootworm management has transformed over the years. Well, the big change was in 2003 when the first BT corn hybrids with activity against rootworms were commercialized, and they were very effective and available from, se from several companies after a few years and became widely adopted. And because of that, people stopped using soil insecticides that historically we'd mostly use to manage rootworms plus crop rotation. And then later on, as uh, corn values went up, uh, a lot of people stopped rotating. 
and we've seen a buildup of rootworm populations in some areas. And then since about 2011, we've documented resistance to some of the BT uh, proteins that are used in different hybrids. And so there's a lot of challenges now to growers to manage rootworms. Describe further the, the rise in resistance that you've seen. Well, initially it was reported in Iowa and Illinois, and we've also documented it in Nebraska that two, there are now four different BT proteins that are available in, in corn hybrids that are active against rootworms. And in several states, we've documented resistance to two of these proteins. And when I say resistance, I don't mean total immunity, mm -hmm. but there's a decrease uh, susceptibility, and sometimes it shows up in decrease in performance also. So growers are looking for new options or actually old options mm -hmm. that they can reapply, such as soil insecticides or planting, planting time insecticides and also foliar insecticides against adults. So with your research that you've done over the past few years, mm -hmm. What are, what's the efficacy of those options and, and uh, how valuable can they be to the producer? Well, I guess the big thing is there's no one, one practice. Uh, people were relying totally on the BT corn hybrids and we need to have an integrated pest management plan using crop rotation, BT corn hybrids, uh, possibly insecticides as needed, uh, but to use a, a multi-pronged approach so we're not relying on one, only one practice. And the big thing we can do in Nebraska some of the states to the east of us, crop rotation has lost its effectiveness, but in, in Nebraska, crop rotation is highly effective in reducing rootworm numbers. And I know a lot of people want to grow continuous corn, but if you can even rotate out of corn every three or four years, that can really help you manage rootworm so you don't have as high populations. What do you mean it's lost its effectiveness? Well, the populations in Illinois and some of the states to the east of us, the beetles have changed their egg laying behavior, so they lay eggs in other crops such as soybeans uh. or wheat. And so when you rotate back to corn, you have eggs again, which you don't have in Nebraska. Rotating with a non-host crop such as soybeans is highly effective at reducing rootworm numbers. As a grower gets ready for this year, how does he or she know if, she, if they have rootworm resistance? Well, mainly the issue would be if you had lack of performance with the BT hybrids you've been growing, either in terms of lodging or root injury or just seeing a lot of adult beetles in the summer. That might be an indication. Uh, it, maybe not resistance, but you have problems with controlling rootworms and need to rethink what you're doing. Are there specific proteins that uh, have shown to be resistant or rootworms resistant to? Yeah, the the two, and we get into some technical terms here, but which I love, Bob. Okay, there's, <laughs> and the BT proteins are referred to by uh, a crystal nomenclature. So we have the Cry 3BB1, which was the first one developed and then also the protein that is in some of the Syngenta hybrids and actually several companies' hybrids called m 3 a We're seeing resistance to those two proteins in parts of Nebraska. We haven't documented the resistance status of every field, but we're seeing this at locations across the state. There's in-depth information about this topic available online for free thanks to a USDA grant. A series of webinars discussing resistance problems and management strategies can be found on the Plant Management Network website. We'll link to that resource on the Market Journal homepage. The January Nebraska farmer says Liberty switchgrass may be commercially available through seed dealers in spring 2016. This month's issue says it's a high-yielding variety specifically bred for bioenergy use. It was developed in Nebraska by USDA scientists Rob Mitchell and colleagues. Mitchell says Liberty has a 25 to 40 percent greater yield than traditional switchgrass varieties. It's been tested in Nebraska and other Midwest states as part of a regional biomass study. You can read more about it in the January Nebraska Farmer. Our previous two episodes of Market Journal have looked ahead at the calving season for Nebraska's farmers and ranchers. This week, Nebraska Extension Forage Specialist Bruce Anderson outlines precautions and sanitary conditions producers can be thinking about. He also explains why watering cattle a different way might be beneficial to an animal's health and performance. But to start, we asked Bruce to update us on the general condition of the state's pasture and ranges as we move into the last week of January. 
Well, I think we're in pretty good shape this year. You know, we haven't had a whole lot of snow out there, and so it's been an open season for uh, the grasslands that are being grazed or the corn residues that, that are being grazed. So a lot of the producers have had some very good access to it. Plus, we went into winter in, in pretty decent shape moisture-wise. So I think uh, all in all, uh, I'm optimistic that we're going to get through the winter in good shape and start out next spring uh, with uh, some good early growth. We touched on this about a year ago in a piece you did for radio, but we wanted to talk about it again this week, and that's using tank water instead of pond or creek water. Why is that something that producers might want to consider during the grazing season? Well, I think when we start looking at what the conditions are like uh, in many of our ponds or our creeks and uh, the kind of sanitation that might be existing out there, uh, we know that uh, uh, while that water starts out good and clean, as the herd of animals wanders into it to get a drink, they start stirring up mud uh, and, and they start making deposits out there that uh, none of us would want to drink. And, and then the calves get in there and they start drinking that water and, and kind of get into some sanitation problems. If we do put our water into uh, some form of tank that can keep it good and clean, uh, the calves are always going to get some decent clean water, uh, be able to uh, avoid some of the light disturbances they may have in their digestive system from the pathogens that they get from the, the dirty material. And as a result, we see that uh, uh, calves oftentimes may wean 20, 25, 30 pounds more weight by having that clean tank water than uh, always having to go into some dirty uh, more contaminated conditions to get their water. Now the problem, or at least one of the concerns would be, this is something that would be time intensive, it can cost some money, what's the justification to it? Well I think the justification comes to that, that added income, at least that gross income that's going to come from the uh, larger calves also might reduce some of the health problems that we have and uh, reduce some of the doctoring that has to go out. Uh, uh, with the herd there. Uh, but of course, everybody has to take a look at what their system might be, how they might be able to do it most efficiently, place the tanks where they do it would be most effective, and, and then find ways to keep the animals out of the creeks and ponds so that they don't choose to go in there anyhow, even if there's a tank nearby. What uh, things could be maybe on the radar as we start to look at calving again and, and thinking about sanitation conditions during that time period? Well, certainly as we get to this time of year, uh, uh, there's probably a couple things we need to be looking at. One is, of course, making sure that we're doing an adequate job of supplementing uh, our cows so that not only do the cows stay good and healthy and are able to calve uh, in good shape and then uh, eventually start rebreeding, but also that we're supplementing them effectively so that uh, the fetus is growing properly and then the calf will uh, survive, grow well, and perform the way we want it to as it, as it gets older. Uh, the other thing is simply the calving environment that we have out there. Uh, there's been a calving system called the Sand Hills Calving System that has been developed. That's really a, a method of trying to keep uh, uh, the environment very clean and safe for the calves by moving animals around, uh, moving the unbred, or excuse me, not the unbred, but the cows that have not calved yet into a fresh area that's going to be clean and healthy for new calves, and avoiding the mingling of older calves with young calves, which tends to spread the pathogens, the bacteria and the viruses that cause scours very readily. Keeping them separate gives us much less uh, health problems for those young baby calves. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here again for the weekly forecast. During this last week, of course, the big news was the very nice warm temperatures, what we would call our January thaw. Uh, unfortunately, my forecast last week was a little bit terrible in terms of the temperature forecast. I was using the GFS, and it was pulling in much colder air than the, the other models that are commonly used, and you, know, you pay the piper. Sometimes you're wrong in the temperatures, but the overall trend was right there. Uh, warm and dry was the name of the game. Nothing in the way of significant moisture. The main system that we paid attention to this week was the one that moved through the southern plains, brought heavy snowfall to portions of Texas, Oklahoma, uh, southern Colorado, and that storm system moved through the southeast and now is expected to move up the eastern seaboard and generate a fairly significant weather maker for the east northeastern United States during this week. And more importantly for us, we're looking at warm conditions continuing at least into the middle of next week before we start to see a gradual cool down 
and unfortunately we don't see any signs of significant moisture until at least the end of this model period. So let's take a look at the upper air pattern and see what we might expect. Of course here we have the troughing pattern across the northeastern United States, a system that uh, essentially had moved through the southern plains, has now moved up the eastern seaboard and that's what we're seeing right here with this trough is an aggressive storm system but more importantly here's our ridge starting to build back in bringing the warmer temperatures into our region. Coolest conditions will be in the northeast closer to this main flow pattern. If the GFS model is correct, we're going to be looking at much cooler conditions in northeast Nebraska and the remainder of the state. If it's wrong, add five degrees to whatever forecast you see for our lowest high temperatures during this period because they're all confined to the northeast. But overall, warmer conditions will build in statewide as we go through the weekend. And by Saturday, we start to see the western part of the state jumping up well into the 50s. The eastern part of the state will be sandwiched between this low pressure system to our east, so the winds will be up. But certainly temperatures are going to be rather enjoyable, easily from the mid-40s in eastern Nebraska to the low 50s will be common. Now as we get into Monday, we start to see this ridge really encroaching our region, so we're looking at mid-50s to mid-60s across the western part of the state mid-50s southeast and up in northeast Nebraska, low 50s. Now as we go into Tuesday, the ridge is centered right over part of the, the center part of the country, warmest temperatures of the period. We could be easily see temperatures in the 60 to 65 degree range in the southwestern portions of the southern panhandle. Further east, we'll be looking at mid-50s and then things start to fall apart on Wednesday as a quick moving trough comes across the northern plains. Not much in the way of any moisture associated with this. A few sprinkles or scattered flurries might be possible during the evening hours. But overall, we're looking at more clouds than anything else. This will slip rapidly by. That's going to drop our temperatures about 5 to 10 degrees. The coldest temperature will be across the northern part of the state. But by Thursday, we'll start to see that ridge start to re-energize itself northward. We start to see some troughing action moving in the western United States. And by Friday, that is starting to move into the central Rockies to some extent. More importantly, as we get into Saturday and Sunday, this system is expected to jack out in the plains and cause some significant snowfall. As we look at our temperature forecast, warm conditions through midweek and then cooling down with that snow coming into the picture next Friday to Saturday. In terms of uh, temperatures, we're looking at colder temperatures from next Thursday through the following Tuesday and precipitation with that storm coming out looks to be above normal through the entire High Plains region. Thanks Al. Today's interviews can be found on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on cattle markets, genetically engineered animals, range and pasture conditions, and corn rootworm resistance. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next week, John Moret will analyze corn and soybean markets, and Tamara Jackson Zims will discuss grain storage quality. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska.